Every time I hear Don Walker speak, I'm impressed by the sincerity and kindness that comes forth, no matter the subject, no matter what he's doing. I'm also now impressed about how great heaven's going to be when you just get to love someone and then they move. You know maybe you can see them again over there. Not maybe, we will see you over there, Don and Jackie. We're going to let Don move to Austin, but Jackie has to stay here. She's a great secretary and a great help to all of us. Don is a graduate of the Southwest School of Bible Studies there in Austin. He met Jackie after he graduated from that school. They have, he says here, eight grandchildren. And he put that in front of his two sons and his two daughters. Oh, you did that? Jackie did that. That's interesting to me. Of course, grandchildren are a whole lot easier to take care of than children. You just spoil them and send them back and hope they treat their parents the way those treated you. <laughs> Don has done local work in Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas. He's been overseas in Bermuda, Costa Rica, the Czech Republic, Jamaica, and South Africa. He is on the World Video Bible School archived class record. How many classes did you record, do you know? About half a dozen. About half a dozen, yeah. Can't remember. He's like me, I can't remember. And uh, he is taught in the Southern California School of Evangelism, Brown Trail School of Preaching, Southwest School of Bible Studies, and presently is our Dean of Admissions here with the Memphis School of Preaching. When I thought about Don and his abilities and his, I'm going to use the word sweetness. I thought about Messiah and I thought he needs to preach to us to build our hopes on the very message that Jesus taught. Brother Don Walker. Thank you, Brother Moser, for such kind words. We do appreciate it and we are honored to be associated with the Memphis School of Preaching. About a year and a half ago, Jackie and I moved here and we moved into a uh, rental house and then a few months after that, we moved again into a home which we purchased and Lord willing, uh, we'll be moving again uh, after the at the end of this school year. My granddad used to say that three moves is equivalent to a burnout. And uh, I believe that, but I would not have traded anything for the time that I've had here and the blessing that it's been to get to know these men in a different context. I knew these men in different areas, lectureships and in acquaintances as we would pass at different times. But to be over here and to work with them and to labor and toil with them has deepened my respect for them and for the great work that is done here. It's been a great blessing for me and uh, I uh, count it a great privilege and honor. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So begins our Bibles in Genesis chapters 1 and verse 1. Then we read, of course, of the creation of man who was made in the image of God. God breathed into him life, and he stood apart from the remainder of creation, different, exalted. And as we consider man and his makeup, we realize and understand that in some ways he is like the animals, he has a physical body, as animals do. He has life, the animating force, which animals do. But that's where the similarities cease. For you and I are triune beings, 
We possess that which ties us to God. We possess that which will prepare us for eternity. And one day, each one of us will lay aside this physical body and we will be clothed upon with that spiritual body fitted for eternity. The great blessing of that truth is that it will fit us to stand in the very presence of our God, something we are unable to do at this time. The danger is that it will also equip us to be tormented in eternity if we are unprepared. And so it is. We consider our theme for the lectureship and it focuses upon this detail, this fact. Those things that you and I long for are things that are in the future. Those things that you and I long for, we have not seen with our eyes. We have not fully experienced, but we have a confidence that they are here. That they are real. And even in many ways more solid and more real than this present world that you and I live in. You and I as Christians, we live in the same world. We face the same struggles that men of the world face. The same challenges you and I have to overcome. The spirit lusteth against the flesh. The flesh lusteth against the spirit. So that you cannot do the things that you would. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. That's not talking about a possibility. Because if we so chose, we could do those things. It's talking about determination. We recognize as Christians, as children of God, we know that this world is temporal. We know that this world and our existence in this world is like the grass of the field that when the sun rises and the heat beats down, it dries up, it withers away, and it's gone. But we also are aware that our spiritual man is renewed day by day. And so you and I operate by hope. We fight. We struggle. We fall at times. We dust ourselves off and we get up again. Stronger determination. Greater resolve that we will do even better as we continue on. That's the idea of the hope that we have. That's the direction to which we're heading. And that's what keeps us going. That's what gives us reason, purpose. You and I understand and realize that though we are pilgrims here passing through as we see in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, chapter 2, also in 2 Peter. But we are citizens of heaven, Philippians 3 and verse 20. And though we do have here bank accounts that we tend to the matters that we must tend to here, we're also laying up treasures in heaven, Matthew 6, 19 and following. You and I understand and realize that we are to set our affection on things that are above where Christ has sat down. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Jesus Christ is our life. Colossians 3 and verse 4. That we are heading toward a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10. And so as we dwell here in this world, as we pass our soul journey here, we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. And every year that we add to our lives, it seems that burden gets heavier and heavier and heavier. But we continue on. And we continue with great peace, a peace that the world doesn't comprehend, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. 
We continue with joy that is much deeper than what the world can provide. John 14, 27. You and I continue with hope. And by that hope we are saved. Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. By that hope we stand. By that hope we are sure. We are certain. We have confidence. The word hope is an interesting word in the English language. It's used in a very, very broad variety of ways. People will speak of hope and they will speak of hope in a context of something that really is nothing more than just a longing that will never happen. People hope to lose weight, but they never invest the time or the energy. They don't cut back on their diet. They don't exercise. And therefore, that which they hope for is not attained. Other times we'll use the term hope. And it puts us in a situation that is outside of our control. As a child, perhaps, we may have hoped for a bicycle for our birthday, perhaps. But that was in the hands of our parents. And if they did not deem that to be the best choice at the time, then that hope went unanswered. But we've got to understand as Christians, when we talk about hope, we need to realize we're not talking about something that is just a longing. We're not talking about something that is outside of our control. But rather we are talking about that with which we have a reason to have confidence concerning its fulfillment. We're talking about that that is solid, that is sure, for it is based upon and it rests upon the divine truth that our God cannot lie. And so when he tells us what waits for us, and when he has, as he has revealed to us, here is how you can attain that, we can approach it with a certainty that if I do follow what my God has revealed in his message, then I will receive the promises that he has made unto me. And for that, we are grateful. For that, we thrill. Because we know the foundation of our hope is sure. Jesus Christ is the anchor of our hope. Steadfast and sure. He has entered into heaven itself. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. Peter would exalt Jehovah, sing his praises. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. That is certain, that is sure. And you and I depend upon it. You and I live by it. Just as sure as that grave is empty, you and I can dwell in heaven with God. And for that we're grateful. Jesus Christ is the hope of us, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. And so you and I, we stand in a very unique position when compared to those who are in the world. One of the great chapters of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, begins with men who are dead in their trespasses and sins. It concludes in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians with the idea that we are now lively stones built together to form a habitation of God through the Spirit. And in the midst of that chapter, we find the redemptive work of Christ and the benefit that it has for you and me. Paul will go through as he begins that chapter and, and he will make a contrast and he'll make it twice. He'll speak of those who once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In the close of verse 3 he says, we were by nature the children of wrath. But, here's the contrast, God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. 
He then goes on and he says in verses 11 and following, when you were in the world, when you were outside of Christ, you were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. That at that time you were without Christ. It's not talking about possession there. It's talking about location. You were outside of Christ. How do you know that? Look at the context. You are without Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus. The contrast. You sometimes were far off. Are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And it all centers and focuses upon our hope. What a sad, sad statement. One of the saddest in the Bible. When you are outside of Christ. When you are in the world. You have no hope. None. Men will do very drastic things when they believe all hope is gone. But you give that man that glimmer of hope and he will rise to occasions with a strength and a fortitude that will amaze us. And as Christians, we have that hope. Think about it in a moment. The idea and the thought of faith, it's bound up within the context of hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith allows us to look past the physical, which is so depressing. Allows us to look past this world, which is so discouraging. Allows us to pull back the curtain and to see that there is another realm in which we dwell. That spiritual realm. Do we not thrill to the context of 2 Kings chapter 6? The army of Syria has come in. They have been thwarted in their efforts to stand against the people of God because the prophet Elisha was able to let the king know the plans. In fact, the, the king of Syria believed that he had a spy among the ranks. But they let him know very quickly that it was the prophet that was doing this. And so he told them, you go find the prophet. We'll take care of him. And the armies of Syria in that evening and that night surrounded the prophet. The servant of the prophet awakened. He looked out. He was scared to death. What are we going to do? And we look at verse 17 of 2 Kings chapter 6. And Elisha prays unto the Jehovah and says, Let him see what I see. Let him see it. And it says the Lord opened his eyes. And there were chariots and horses of fire on the mountains surrounding Elisha. We pull back that curtain and we get a whole different perspective of what's going on. We look in this world, the homosexuals rule the day. Wickedness is normal. Our government pushes it. But you pull back that curtain. The lamb that was slain is standing. As we see in Revelation chapter 5. God is on the throne ruling and the righteous are rewarded. And that's faith. And that's the hope that comes with that faith. And so we see, as we consider all of this, it brings us to our message, the main thrust at least. And we're reminded of Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God that presents for you and me the message. Now, if I had to sum up the message of the Bible in one statement, one sentence, one thought. I believe I would do it something along these lines. The message of the Bible is God's loving grace as it is expressed through Jesus Christ 
to the salvation of the souls of men. That's the message. That's what everything centers around. God loves you. He sent his son. And only through his son, you can be blessed spiritually. You can be prepared to stand before God. To dwell in the very presence of God. And that, of course, is the definition of heaven. The reward that is waiting for us. And we're able through the message that God has revealed to us to get a glimpse of that here. And he gives us enough information. He gives us enough divine truth. All that we need to sustain us and carry us through this life. The gospel is God's power to save. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Romans 1, 16 and 17. We are to lay aside all filthiness and overflowing of naughtiness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. James 1 and verse 21. We have been begotten again by the word of grace. James chapter 1 and verse 18. We're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. As we see in 1 Peter rather, chapter 1 and verse 23. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We're talking about the message of Jehovah. We're talking about what that word can do when men turn their attention to that word and when they apply themselves the way that they ought to concerning that word. For example, open with me, if you will, to the Psalm of Revelation, Psalm 19. You have the revelation of creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. And so it is. There's no one in this world that has an excuse to not seek after God. In fact, Paul made that point in Romans chapter 1. The Gentiles were without excuse. Why? Because the things seen proclaim that which is not seen. God exists. And all how that has confounded every fool that says there is no God. How do you get around it? The simplicity of that point is its power. But as we continue in that psalm, beginning with verse 7, he turns his attention now to the revelation of God's word. And listen to what he says concerning that revelation and what it can accomplish for you and me. Beginning with verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. And righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them thy servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. The word of God, the message of Jehovah, that's why it provides hope for you and me. Now, when I consider that message and I look in the, in the context of what is it, define the message for me. In, in a practical way, we would turn and look at different individuals to begin. We'd begin with John the Baptist, for example. John the Baptist had a two-point message. His sermons, his preaching focused on two things. Number one, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You need to repent. Prepare yourself. It's coming. It's coming. The second point, there cometh one mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I'm unworthy to unlatch. As we see in Mark 1 and verse 7, he must increase, I must decrease. You see the two points that John preached. Number one, he is the Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, John, John 1, 29. And the church, the kingdom. 
I listened to the preaching of my Savior, Jesus, while he's here on earth. His message was the same as John's message. He proclaimed his own deity. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12, Paul lets Timothy know he could not deny himself. In John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, when the discussion had centered upon worship, the lady, the woman at the well, says, uh, when Messiah comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus let her know, the one that's speaking to you, he's Messiah. He preached his deity. Every time he said, I came down from the Father, they took up stones to stone him to death because he was claiming to be God. Every time he said, I'm going back to the Father, they accused him of blasphemy because he's claiming to be God. And Jesus preached the kingdom of heavens at hand. He was preaching the good news of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. John chapter 3. Born of the water and the spirit. Verse 3 and verse 5. He preached the kingdom. And even when we see the apostles preaching in the book of Acts, the message doesn't change much. There's a slight change. A significant change. They preached Jesus. They preached him as the son of God, the Messiah. They preached that there was salvation in none other, Acts 4 and verse 12. There's the message. I've determined to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. That's the message. And they preached the kingdom. However, their message was not the kingdom was at hand. Their message was the kingdom's a reality. The kingdom's here. Look in Acts chapter 8. When Philip goes out, there is a scattering abroad because of the persecution that Saul of Tarsus was bringing upon the church. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. Why? Because that's how you produce hope. Verse 5 says that he was preaching Christ. Verse 35 says, as he spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, he preached unto him Jesus. In chapter 8 and verse 12 of the book of Acts in Samaria, he preached the kingdom and the Christ. Realities, truths, certain, distinct, necessary, essential truths. So that men would have hope. You close the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31. Paul is in his own rented apartment, his house. He's imprisoned there. But he's able to receive visitors, and what's he doing? He's teaching concerning the kingdom, the church, and the Christ. There's the message. There's the hope. That's what we are to do, you and I. We're to proclaim that message. We're to let people know that there is a Savior. We're to let people know that hope is in Him. As we go through God's word, we realize that it's the message that provides the hope. You take away the message, you take away the word, you take away the doctrine, you take away the truth, you take away the faith, and you take away hope. But look at it. What kind of hope? What does it provide for us? Number one, it provides hope for cleansing. In Psalm 119, verse 11. Whither withal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed unto thy word? That's true now, just as true as it was then. Now look at the situation. Here is a young man whose ways are not what they ought to be. They are unclean. How is he going to get right? How is he going to cleanse his ways? He's going to turn to the word of God, the message. Because the message gives us hope. The message shows us that we don't have to stand with our sin. We don't have to stand soiled and unclean and unholy. We can stand pure before our God. If we'll follow the precepts that are recorded for us. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, we study that through God's word, and we know walking in the light is walking in the light of the message, 
The entrance of thy word giveth light, Psalm 119, verse 130. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, Psalm 119, verse 105. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another and his blood cleanses us. I know that because the Bible tells me, the message tells me that. And I have hope for cleansing because of this message. And I know the validity of this message. I know it's true. You and I have hope for avoiding sin. And that ought to be the goal of every one of us. I don't want to have to cleanse myself. I would rather avoid that which makes me unclean. Which separates me from my God. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's how you and I can overcome sin. Jesus gave us that example. It is written. It is written. It is written three times. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. I'm convinced that we have many brethren today who are doing things that are contrary to God's will because they are ignorant of God's word. Hebrews chapter 5, for when for the time they ought to be teachers, they have need that someone teach them again what be the first principles of the oracles of God. They have need of milk instead of strong meat. And they're out there doing things, introducing instruments of music, fellowship and denominations. They're doing it because they don't know what the Bible teaches. They do not have their senses exercised unto good works. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. And that's a sad commentary for the Lord's church today. It gives us hope for avoiding sin. It gives us hope for being equipped to face whatever the devil brings at us. To fight the battle. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. We're good soldiers of Jesus Christ as we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 through 4. And so we equip ourselves. We go through and we realize that we gird up the loins with the truth of God's word. We recognize that we take the breastplate of righteousness. Thy commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119 verse 172. We have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel is the word of God. It saves our souls the good news. We have the helmet of salvation. We're saved by the word of God. We have the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You see, it's God's word that equips us. It's God's word that makes us ready for the battle. It's that message that makes us strong. And so it is. We have the hope of being equipped. We have hope in a practical way. How do we apply it? How can we be strong? It's really quite simple. As we study God's word, we learn, number one, there is value in reading God's word. In Ezra chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, Ezra stood before the people, and what did he do? He opened the books, and he read. He read. Give attendance to reading. The man of God was told in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. But brethren, reading is not enough. We've got to go further. And so we take it the next step, and what do we do? We don't just read God's Word, we study God's Word. And there's a difference. Acts 17, nobility is placed upon the Bereans. Why? They searched the Scriptures daily. They ransacked the Scriptures to see if these things were so. We're all familiar with 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are going to be some very red faces in the day of judgment, I'm afraid. Because of many of my brethren who don't know God's word. Who have not studied, they're going to be embarrassed. And we ought to prepare for that now. To alleviate that problem. By studying God's word. But studying's not enough. Look at there, our first response. <laughs> Studying's not enough. We must meditate on the Word of God. Plant it within our minds. Memorization. I know that's a, a bad word for some people. Our students act like we're punishing them 
when we give them memory work. We're blessing them, right, brother? That's a blessing for them, preparing them. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You can't do that without putting God's word in your mind. As we go through, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, verse 97. I'll meditate in thy precepts. Have respect unto thy ways. I'll delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy words. Psalm 119, verses 15 and 16. Those two verses, in my estimation, serve very well to summarize the thought of Psalm 119. Focused upon the word of God, but it's got to be more than just words on a page. We've got to put it in our minds. Because as a man thinketh in his mind, so is he. The principle's the same in the new covenant. Whatsoever things are true and honest and lovely and just and pure, of good report, think on these things. Meditate on these things. Roll them over in your mind continually. That's how you transform yourself. That's how you become what God wants you to become. Then what will follow will be the application of that word in our lives. That's how it begins to be shown in our conduct, in the way that we live. And that's where the hope is. Because we become more and more like our Lord and less and less like Don Walker. More and more like God wants us to be. And less and less what the devil wants us to be. And that's what we're all striving for. Paul put it this way in the book of Colossians chapter 1. Beginning with verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that you might, number one, increase in the knowledge of his will. What do you have to do? You've got to turn to the word of God to do that. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, you have to have the right attitude. You'll get out of Bible study what you want to get out of it. If you have a hobby that you want to propagate, if you have an argument that you want to win, you'll find it in there somewhere. You'll have to twist it a little bit. You'll have to bring it out of context, but you'll find it. But if you want to learn God's will so you can do God's will so that he will bless you, you'll get that out of it also. The attitude, you see. Too many have the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face and idols built up in their mind. Just like the people of old in Ezekiel chapter 14. They have their minds made up. Doesn't matter what the word of God says. I know what I want to do. Got to have the right attitude. Walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, you have to apply it. You have to make it alive in you. The result will be you'll be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, increasing in that fellowship and that intimacy with God. That's the blessing of the message and the hope that we have because our foundation is sure, 1 Timothy 2, 9. And it will not be shaken. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the words of Jehovah will stand. And if we stand with those words, our hope will be swallowed up in reality and we will stand in the presence of our God. Thank you.